I first met him in the early 80s, in the Chinatown of urban Java. He didn't want his real name or address revealed, so we called him DJ for Dynamo Jack. He was only a healer, he said, but he did direct a powerful energy generated from his own body into his patients. Sometimes he used the needles, sometimes just his hands. He called the energy Qi, and it was so strong that he usually needed a grounder to hold his patient's feet. For years we followed him around Java on his healing rounds, pleading to be allowed to film him, but he always refused, saying his powers resulted from a type of meditation with an ancient tradition of secrecy. It was only when my brother Lorn was suffering from a serious eye infection that he finally allowed us to film him in 1987. It was nothing like any acupuncture I'd ever had. I was getting really powerful electric shocks and couldn't control my movements at all. In Yang, positive and negative, you know. Mm -hmm. And my positive from here and my negative from here. Mm -hmm. And we meet together, this can get uh, like electricity. And is this because you're special, you have a special sort of uh, no, it's body? meditation every day. It's meditation that does it. It's meditation every day. Like you can touch me, I like this. Me. It's nothing, okay? Mm. It's my burn. Uh, it's like this. <laughs> For our sound recordist, it was also a shocker. He then took our newspaper outside and showed us how qi can also be used to set things on fire. When he heard we'd shown this footage in public, he was very upset and refused all our future efforts to contact him again. As the years passed, we sadly resigned ourselves to never seeing him again. My brother Lorne never did, for by 1997 he was already dead, when I again found myself with DJ, now treating me for an eye problem. But it wasn't this that brought me back. He had tracked me down, out of the blue, and invited me to tell me a story. He had just returned from two years on a deep meditational journey, alone in the heart of Borneo. Amongst his revelations he had seen, he said, how history was moving on into great change and the old wisdom was vanishing. So he called me back to film just enough of him to remind us that we all have undreamed of powers sleeping within us and that there's nothing special about him except for his training in waking room. Yeah. Grounding this patient, my cameraman Joe is having to use all his weight to keep contact. She is pushing him away. He seems able to control the amplitude of this chi, like a dimmer switch and it causes uncontrollable responses in the patients and their grounders. I can barely keep my hand on you. Fly off the electricity so strong. This mother unwittingly grounds her child. He won't sit still, so she's asked to hold him and grin and bear it. Sometimes, signs of this passing energy can be seen in the transmitter, too. This chi stuff is only the surface, he says, of the real adventure, beneath, in the meditational technique. Projecting chi from the palm of the hand can also be used to resist rifle pellets, he says. First, you learn to distinguish between yin and yang chi in your body. Then, how to pull it in your navel chakra. Then, how to project it, he says. 
And it's the proportionate mixture between yin and yang which accounts for different effects, like pulling or pushing objects or igniting them. Then he gets really strange. He says that mastering yin qi is the key to the spirit world. There's a discussion regarding this feeling-based prayer, this lost mode of prayer, uh, sometimes seems a little more than academic uh, until we can actually apply it in our lives or see it applied in our lives. It's in the late 1990s that I had the opportunity to do precisely that when I saw the footage documenting uh, the healing of a life-threatening condition within the body of a living woman using precisely the kinds of techniques that we're speaking about right now. For me, it was this kind of information that took this lost modality of prayer out of the realm of, of academics and into something that's very real that we can apply in our lives. I had the opportunity during that time to see some video footage of the healing of a three-inch diameter bladder cancer inside the body of a woman who by medical, Western medical standards had been diagnosed inoperable. She had gone as a last resort to a medicineless hospital in Beijing, China. It was in this medicineless hospital where they began simply by addressing uh, the life-affirming ways that she could change how she was living her life. They taught her life-affirming ways to breathe and life-affirming ways to nourish her body, gentle movements to stimulate the energy centers in her body. And as she was doing these and strengthening her body, at one point it made sense to undergo a process. Now I'd like to, to share this, I'd like to describe it to you uh, as a very potent example of how the feeling world inside of our bodies has a direct effect, uh, in this case a very graphic effect, on the world beyond our bodies. So in the video documentation, the film shows a woman lying on a, uh, in, in a hospital room. She's fully awake, she's fully conscious, she believes in the process that's about to happen. Before her, there is an ultrasound technician who is running an ultrasound wand over her lower abdomen that we can see on a split screen television. And on the left hand side of the screen, they do a snapshot, a freeze frame of an instant in time for reference so we can see what her condition looked like in that instant in time. On the right hand side of the screen, we are able to watch real time as three practitioners stand behind her, working with the energy in her body and with the feelings in their bodies. And what they do is they begin to chant a word that to them they've agreed upon that reinforces the feeling within them that she's already healed. The chant essentially says already healed, already done. And as they begin to, to have this feeling and to say these words among themselves, on the computer screen, on the television screen, we can watch in real time this cancerous tumor as it disappears in less than three minutes real time. It's not like time lapse on a documentary where you see a rose unfold uh, in 30 seconds and something that normally takes days. This literally happens in less than three minutes. Her body responded to the feelings of the practitioners who were trained to have the kinds of feelings that they were having. And all they were feeling was the feeling of what it feels like to be in the presence of a woman who is already healed, fully enabled, fully capacitated. They were not seeing her as a woman who was sick and they weren't saying, bad cancer, you've got to go away.